a little bit country, he's a little bit rock and roll. Ward and Al on Sirius XM, Canada Talks. What we are listening to, Al, is The Glory of Love, the number one hit for mm. Peter Cetera from the movie Karate Kid Part 2. Little it's tidbit. A good, it's a good one. Little tidbit for right? you. Mm-hmm. Wasn't written for the Karate Kid Part 2. What was it written for? Rocky Four. And what happened? Sylvester Stallone told yep. Peter Cetera he wanted the song. Yep. And uh, but that he did not want Peter Cetera to sing it; that it would be sung oh. by Frank Stallone. <laughs> I want to hear Frank Stallone sing this song so bad. Yeah. So Peter Cetera withdrew the song, and uh, he said it was only like two months later. The Karate Kid Part Two producers called him, said, "We'll take the song." He had to change a few of the lyrics, released it, and it was a number one solo hit for him. Wow. Yeah, huge hit, huge hit. That um, song was everywhere. I guess was it nineteen eighty six? Like, don't get me wrong. I get it. You want to throw your brother a bone. Yeah. But come on. Yeah. That, uh, well, Frank Stallone has appeared in, you know, pretty much every. Uh... Listen, I adore, you know, you know me as the yeah. lesser sibling in a sibling duo. I love all the secondary siblings. Okay. Uh, I, I love Frank and Luke and Steven and Randy. Um, I I just come on. Let's not be ridiculous. Mm, by all means, that's all I'm saying. Well, this was a huge hit for Peter Cetera. It was uh, number one for a couple of weeks. Spent some like five weeks on the adult contemporary chart, and uh, I got very lucky. Uh, I'm a huge Peter Cetera fan. I've yeah. I've uh, he's one of my idols. I'm a big vocalist fan, and he's one of the I think one of the greatest pop vocalists of all time. And I got to go down to Falls View Resort and Casino in Niagara Falls and see him in concert. And I got to have a nice chat with him. I was supposed to get 10 minutes with him and we sat down for about 35. Wow. And he was just a great guy. And we had a great conversation all about his days in Chicago, his solo years, living life in Idaho in seclusion. Yep. And uh, God, what? Ward, I'd love to hear this chat. As luck would have it, we have it here now, Al. Wow. I did not know that's where we were going with this. Oh, the power of recording. If you guys could see Ward's face right now, like you would die. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so why don't we go to my interview with Peter Cetera right now? Peter Cetera. Hello, sir. Good afternoon. <laughs> How are you? So one of the questions I've got to start off asking is, um, you know, I always say it's crazy where this business takes you, uh, show business. And by that, I say, here I am, an American comedian from Atlanta who wound up doing talk radio in Canada. So how does a uh, musician from Chicago wind up living in Idaho? I back, um, back about 78, uh, was just looking for another place to go skiing. And when I was still with Chicago, we had moved from Chicago to LA. And I had about a month off from a tour. And so took a little, little trailer and, uh, um, drove to uh, Grand Canyon and saw all that, and then went to different ski resorts. Went to Jackson Hole, went to uh, Park City, and then ended up as we're driving back. Oh, look, there's a sign for Sun Valley. Well, I've never been there, you know, and made the turn and ended up, and it was right in the fall, beautiful, and uh, we decided to go back. Uh, you know, in the upcoming Christmas. So ran another place, immediately met some people, and bam, started going back there. And then when the eventual split with Chicago happened, I didn't want to raise my, my first daughter in L.A. And um, I thought it would be good for my career to go hide from show business up in the middle of Idaho. And of course, yeah, that's really good for your career. <laughs> How do you like uh, the people up there? I mean, I take it they've gotten used to you? being there for it's been 25 years now small town you know 
great people. Small town, big hell. I mean, uh, there's, you know, but, uh, you know, I love the people there, and it's kind of my kind of people. And, uh, yeah. Was it that kind of living that inspired lyrics from, say, Another Perfect World? When in Perfect World you say, I don't need to be near the lights of the big city? Yeah, and well, that's exactly what that song was about. Uh, um, actually wrote it with a, wrote the music with a friend of mine who uh, was in Nashville at the time. And, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I sort of thought, well, I'll show them. I'll get away and I'll have my own successful solo career up and, you know, coming out of Idaho. But, of course, it... Um, kind of doesn't work that way <laughs> you know it's like hey you want to do something well come right now and I know you know I'm I'm, I'm you know three plane fl you know plane flights away from getting there so <laughs> anyhow but you know it's it is interesting how many um celebrities do that nowadays you know David Letterman lives in Montana uh, most of his weeks and uh it's an interesting thing so many celebrities get that way especially those who grew up in a city you know, that they suddenly long for something outside of that just to, to get away from everything and feel for a little while normal, you know. So I could actually totally get that. I could also see where it could benefit you as a songwriter to clear your head a little bit and get into something other than the noise of show business and the industry. Yeah, it's, it's good and it's bad for, uh, you know, I mean, at the time I thought I could get away and do what you just said, you know. And then at a certain point, you sort of realize that you're really out of the spotlight up there. So you better really, you better really love living up there. And I did for, you know, I, I uh, had a, started the solo career, had a couple of big hits, but unfortunately I was with a record company that didn't want me to be successful. They wanted me to be back with Chicago. So they sort of sabotaged, even though I had two, you know, two number one hits right out of the bat off my solo album, the album wasn't pushed. And, and so I sort of got in a kind of a crabby mood about that and, even though I went on the road for a little while, um, you know, when you're not pushed, when you're not helped out there, it's tough. And so uh, I sort of retired from show business, you know. Yeah. Well, I'll show them. I'll, I'll quit. That's what I'll do. And I'll ski and I'll hike and I'll climb and I'll, you know. So uh, I did for a while. It's nice to see you back out on tour. You, there's some people who seem to never stop touring and love that. They love to always be on the road. Some of your fellow former bandmates, an example, right? Mm -hmm. Do you like being back out on the road? Because I know at one point in the 80s, the touring got to be such a grind that it got exhausting. Yeah, there's, there's a misconception about, well, Chicago says the reason is that you didn't want to tour. And not really. I didn't want to tour with you is what the reason was, you know. There were just too many problems uh, in her band, and and uh, they thought it was time for me to shut up or or go, and so did I. So funny how that works. No, it was. It's not the grind of the road that was. It was the it was the grind of the people that I was with on the road. So when I went out with my solo thing, I say without any help from any record companies, you know, it was it's tough. So I took I did take a break for years. And, and then I started, you know, yeah, there's a certain point when you can exercise yourself into oblivion. And then there's a point when I went, well, there's probably no room musically out there for me anyhow. And, uh, you know, I'll show them. I'll just quit. <laughs> yeah, so there was, there, was a, there was a time when I didn't feel I fit in any, in any, anywhere, so... You know, it's interesting you say that about it was who you were touring with that changed everything. You know, comedians talk about this a lot where I've said, you know, oh, I hated touring when I was living in my car and it was 45 weeks a year. I like it now that it's once a month and I fly in and out of where I'm going. So people don't realize it's not just touring, but the conditions under which you're touring change everything, right? Or Yeah, or like I said, who I was then touring with, which was... But now, uh, you know, I sort of got re re-enthused and, you know, the travel is a drag because there's no more private jets and there's no more this and there's, and that's the part that's really hard. I mean, the, the getting to the airport and yeah. being groped and gone <laughs> over by, yeah. by TSA agents and, 
it's the travel that's the hard part. It's the getting to the place you're playing, and it's once kind of I I get dressed and take a few steps on stage, and then it's kind of oh, okay, yeah, yeah, it's really fun. And then once you're done, then you walk off stage. It's like oh god, that room service and that flight and that 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 that. So yeah, it's it's never about the travel. But you know you know people still to this day say, wow, I did you. Get to see a lot when you were there, and I went, yeah, I saw my hotel room and the dressing room and the <laughs> yeah. stage, and then my dressing room and the hotel room. The staff. And the staff, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, You know, it's funny, you talk about for a while not feeling like you had a place. Um, friend of the show, friend of mine, Fernando Varela, talked about performing with you at some David Foster stuff oh. over in Asia, and said, you know, the audiences over there, he said, you would see Peter Cetera go up there, and he said, it's as if they had never seen a superstar before. You know, he said it was like it was like 1986 yeah. all over again. Did, did it feel like in parts of the globe there were these audiences that just never left that, that it was it was like time froze in 1986? Well, I mean, I didn't know that, you know, I mean, I, I didn't know. And of course, Asia has always been a big, uh, but, you know, funny you mentioned David Foster because David Foster is actually the one that got me back on stage oh. years back. I, I can't even remember, uh, you know, you know, like I say, I sort of gave it up for a while. And then he called out of the clear blue sky and said, hey, listen, I'm doing this uh, big worldwide charity uh, thing for McDonald's Corporation in Chicago at uh, McCormick Place. And we're gonna have, you know, the Queen of Sweden and this and that. And it was a big, big night. And he said, would you be interested in coming up and doing a couple of the things with the symphony? And I went, oh, geez, I haven't. Come on, come on, come on. And he called back again and again, and I finally agreed to doing it. And we put together just a little, about an eight-minute medley of like three or four songs. Yeah. And it was the first time I'd been on stage, maybe five years or so. And that was actually the start. PBS saw that, and they said, hey, would you want to do a special with the symphony? And I went, okay. So that took me a while to put that together. And, and from that, I did a whole, a whole bunch of symphony shows. And then that, that kind of, well, does he do anything electric? You know? And then I put together an electric band. And that's where we are now. I've, I've been doing this for, I don't know, 15 years or whatever with the electric, uh, electric seven-piece electric band. And um, I'm having a hoot. I hear, you know, I interview a lot of musicians and bands and all that, and I hear people talk about a passion for certain instruments, passion for singing or anything. You didn't start off playing bass. Do you have a passion for playing bass, or is it more the vocals that attracts you as a musician? Yeah, no, I, I don't. I don't have a passion for playing bass. I, I think I have a. I think I have a passion for. You know, it's that. Uh, it's the whole thing of singing and writing and uh, you know i don't do too much writing now because i you know i'm sort of that bad student that studies the night before the test <laughs> and i usually don't write until I, unless i have a purpose right now i don't have a purpose i wish i did but uh i think it's the writing as well that when you first you come up with this melody over the top of this chord thing oh my god i love that you know but bass playing i know everybody I, and I, I just started playing bass on stage again for a couple of songs and that God, people just love it. It's okay, I'll, I'll do it, you know. But, uh, you know, I started out playing the accordion when I was a kid because my parents mm -hmm. would not let me get a guitar, you know. And that whole thing, you know, into the high school bands, into the playing the dances and the blah, 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 blah. And so now, yeah, I mean, it's fun going on stage and, and singing and, uh, I, you know, and I think you know, getting back to your question about the crowds, you know, I, yeah, there's just this renewed thing that I can sense with the crowds. It's maybe they think it's like, we better see him before he dies. You know, I have no idea what it is, <laughs> but, but my gosh, it's been so much fun and it's been so good. And the crowd's been wonderful. And I have the best band I've ever had in my entire life. So we are smoking on stage. So it's great. I'm glad you said that about songwriting, because we say all the time, whenever I meet musicians, I go, you know, it's interesting, because musicians meet comedians, and they go, how do you guys do what you yeah, do? Exa exactly. That, that, was, <laughs> that was my question. Yeah, sure. 
but see, I meet songwriters and I go, how? I, I, when I was younger, I wrote a couple of songs and it took me a year to write each of them. And I didn't know what a bridge was and all this stuff. And then I meet people that are like, oh yeah, you know, I wake up every day and I write a song and I just, I, that's crazy. So it's actually refreshing when I meet successful singer songwriters who go, oh no, I got to be inspired. And the inspiration hasn't been there yeah. in a long time because it, it's just to me such a, such a job. It just seems like such a job. Yeah, to me, this whole songwriting thing, I, you know, I, I once had a friend who uh, was um, out in L.A. years ago, and he said, yeah, I'm going to go to Nashville. I, uh, you know, want to want to get into country music. I can write them a dime a dozen. He said, that, I probably got about 500, 600 ready to go. And I went, really? How many of them are good? Yeah. You know, that's the, I mean, to me, Writing a song is just it's just it's like anything else. I mean you can you can say you're a songwriter and you can say they're great, but <laughs> yeah, I, I don't you know, it's funny, I don't write I don't finish a song unless I like it. So you know, it may start out with a cute little thing for about ten seconds. Oh, I like that. And if I can't push it anywhere or it doesn't go anywhere, I'll just keep trying it and then I'll just forget about it, you know. Um a songwriter in me is like, oh my God, I've got to write a song, you know, and then, and then sometimes you get inspired and, but it, it doesn't come easy to me. It, it comes, it comes very difficult and with a lot of angst and a lot of, uh, but that's why I think it's the most fun. I mean, it's the most fun when I can be sitting in a room and have this thing. And when I come up with the melody to those chords, it's like, my God, I love that. And I'll keep singing it over and see where it goes, you know, and then fit in the words. I, to me, songwriting is about melody. Yeah. It's about the melody. Um, I, I'm not really a wordsmith, you know, not at all. I'm, so I tend to write words from the heart, you know, sim simplistic words. That's the way I talk anyhow. Uh, but I would bet 99% of the songs that people like um, they could sing it to yeah. your, you know, hum the melody, and maybe not so much with the words. I mean, words are important, but to me, it's always been about the melody, and that's kind of what I base my writing on. I want to ask you about a couple of relationships. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if someone had told you back in, say, 1979, 1980, that you were going to team up with this producer named, and songwriter named David Foster, and that 30 some odd years later, you know, you'd still work with him and that you guys would still be friends and you'd still be coworkers or whatever. Would you have believed that back then? Because it seems like such an interesting relationship that was lightning in a bottle that, you know, remains to this day. Yeah. Well, first of all, I would have said who, you know, I, cause I, <laughs> I never heard of him until the record company brought him, uh, brought him to my, to my attention. We were still with Chicago. Uh, yeah. And it's unique. I mean, we came up I mean, we wrote some damn good songs, you know. Mm -hmm. You're the inspiration and hard to say I'm sorry and glory of love and stay the night. I mean, you know, we wrote, you know, I tell the people on stage, everybody thinks that I do nothing but sit around writing ballads. And, and you know, the fact of the matter is if you listen to anything, even with Chicago or back through my solo career, you know, it, maybe the CD has one or two ballads and the rest is up tempo stuff. It's just, it's just that you're the ones that pick it, you know, mm -hmm. you know, the audience and the crowds are the ones like, oh, my God, they they just love me doing those kind of things. And you're and you're right with David. It was wham. We just hit it off and had a, you know, and to this day, when I when I do the shows with David, um, it's pretty important. You you mentioned going over to Asia. Yeah, they're they're like. You know, you can go to Manila and they, I don't even have to sing. We just start the song, I'll say the first word, and the crowd is like uh, singing. And it's, yeah, for me, it's, uh, you know, I enjoy doing it, doing it with David. I, I've always tried to get him back in to try and write again, and uh, it's pretty hard with what on his schedule as well. I, um, I like what you just said about the singles and the album is I was telling my co-host, we were talking about you yesterday and she had said, what's something about Peter Cetera you would tell people that the average person wouldn't know. Right. Okay. A and I said, and I said, I would say that he's an album artist that got single success because yeah. I have all your albums and I go, you know, 
you listen to, I go, this was a guy who actually wrote and put together these albums like, you know, especially coming up in the seventies, like you did with Chicago, yeah. this AOR sound. And I said, his solo albums were like that. He just had the single success because you got these, you know, up-tempo songs, eight tracks, and then two were these yeah. ballads. Yeah. And I mean, oh, well, you know, that's the way it goes. I mean, what you probably don't know about me is, <laughs> well, big Beatle fan. There's no, no one bigger than me, but I mean, I like, I like ACDC, you know what I mean? I, I, I you know, I would take about five of their songs and yeah. I could just loop those all together. And, and uh, so inside I'm a, I'm a rocker yeah. in deep. I mean, I'm a rock and roller inside. And, uh, which is funny because I haven't had success doing that. I've had success doing the other thing. Um, so yeah, I think the music I listen to is like, what well, do you do? You listen to to uh, '60s, '70s classic? I no, I hate. I no, no, I don't want to hear that. I, my my brain. I actually, you know, we were talking about comedy before. I'm, I'm more tuned in to comedy than I am to even music. You know, I mean, I watch all the shows. I watch all. I think I'm probably a comedian at heart, right? Yeah. Uh, and and I think two of the hardest things to me that people probably don't understand is uh, being a comedian, being a tenor. Those two things, because you're, you know, you can get your ass handed to you really easy with those two things. Either you, you know, you're a tenor, you miss the high C, your career's about over. Uh, comedians, I mean, people don't understand. You go on that stage, and maybe I don't want to laugh, and I'm in the crowd, you know, and I don't, I don't know how you guys do it, but, um, yeah. So, and being a singer, when I when I go on stage, people say, you know, you're nervous. So, well, of course I'm nervous, you know. It's just sort of like sports, you know. I'm not very, I'm not a very pleasant person right before I go on stage for maybe an hour, you know. And then I go on stage, and it's kind of like sports. It takes a play or two or, or a song or two to catch your breath and get into the flow of whatever's going on. Yeah. It's, it's refreshing to hear you say that because I've always wanted to talk to a professional singer about it because i sung with friends and back up and sung with bands in high school and i told someone once you know someone asked about it they go wow that's it's great you can sing tenor and i go oh you know and as i've gotten older it's gone from tenor one to mm. tenor two <laughs> you know yeah, yeah, sure. and how do you how do you keep a tenor voice strong for 50 years right well there's certain little secrets like dropping the keys. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I always felt that in back recording with Chicago in that period of time, there was this ridiculous thing that happened where you got to sing high, everything. And so every key was raised to the utmost ridiculous height. And so I was never comfortable singing that high, you know, never comfortable. Yeah. And I, I mean, I always felt like you were, I was going to get my ass handed to me every night. And it was, I mean, some nights, I mean, it was just too much. And I just never felt comfortable because everything was too high. And, uh, yeah. you know, there was never that, oh, let's be sensible about this. You know, lower the key to where I can sing high enough because I have kind of a high voice. I'm not a, um, uh, I don't know, I, I have... I have a, I don't know what that term is, but where well, you have a high voice, but you're not, you know, some people, most people who sing falsetto can go way higher than I, yeah. and, and, and some people in natural voice can. I just sound like I'm always high. Oh, I sound like I'm always high. But da boom. <laughs> nice. But uh, yes, thank you. And um, yeah, so it's about the keys and about the, and, you know, look, I think I learned my lesson with the drugs and the drinking and the smoking. And, you know, I mean, I've been there and done that, you know. So I try and stay in somewhat decent shape, stay away from that thing and um, warm up and practice and sing. And, and, and hopefully every night it's still there, you know. Yeah, that was, uh, I remember seeing a documentary about uh, Journey and replacing Steve Perry with Arnel Pineda. Mm -hmm. And they were like, no, we're going to do it all in the original key. And I was like, take it easy on this guy. You know, just drop it a little bit. He doesn't, <laughs> you're, you're killing this guy. You know, not yeah. everyone, not everyone can sing like a 20 year old when they hit 50, right? He can do it though. Yeah. Uh, he, it's he, crazy though. He, he's, he's a great guy. Yeah. He, he really is. And he's, um, but yeah, I mean, there's just, it's the way it goes. You know, I mean, if, 
the, you know, the crowd really can't tell if you lower the key a little bit, you know? No, no. I mean, I'd much rather lower the key and sound good than not lower the key and sound like you're squeezing your yeah. genitals together, you know what I mean? <laughs> But you're, but you're absolutely right, you know, as a tenor, you hit one wrong note, and it's not even people say he had a bad, bad night. They'll go, oh, he doesn't sing, he can't sing anymore, you know? It's oh, brutal. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I mean, it, you know, Pavarotti, you know, those, those guys, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing, that whole psyche, what, what that thing does with that high C. So it's pretty, um, I, I, <laughs> Back in the day with Chicago, when, when we first kind of started, when we got one of our, I think it might have been the first time we were at a, a Fillmore. We were in the Fillmore East. Mm -hmm. And um, we were opening, you know. They usually had three bands, and, you know, the lesser known band would open, and then, and then, oh, and then the headliner. And we were opening, and uh, our, our producer at the time came back and he said, Boy, I hope you guys are good tonight because I have. Leonard Bernstein in the audience, you know. <laughs> oh my God! And so, what did we do? I got talked into opening up with probably one of the highest songs I used to sing. That's Question '67 and '68. Yeah. And uh, sure enough, boy, we come on stage, we go into a song I didn't even think about it, and boy, I cracked right on the opening line, and, and it just ruined me. It just ruined me for the evening. And, and now the worst is you've got all these tenor vocal groups. Like we're friends with this act called the Tenors, oh, I know, right? I know them well. The and Canadian I, Tenors. Yeah, well, they're just called the Tenors now. Yeah, I know. Tell them hi for me. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're friends of the show. And I told them, I go, you poor guys. I go, you've got to sing in this key now the rest of your careers. I go, enjoy your herbal tea for the next fifty years. You're gonna have to sing like that. That, that that's the truth. They got me. They they got me hooked on this. Yeah, garlic or whatever the hell that was that they were garlic oil or some kind of oil. I said, "What do you guys? What do you guys do? How do you know? Yeah. Oh, oh, we gotta put this and drink this on your tongue." And, and uh, yeah, no, that's amazing oh, to me. I gotta try that. You have to. Um, yeah, you gotta watch it. I, 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 I've just, I've just gotten over this. Mm, it went from a chest thing to a what I thought was a throat issue and then and then of course now I find out it's been a sinus thing that I've had for over a month and a half two months and it's been like I've been walking on pins and needles walking on stage going please you know um, so it's nerve-wracking it isn't you know and yes is it fun to sing you bet it's fun to sing uh, it, it's great to know that people love to hear me sing and love to hear the songs that I you know, because they mean so much to so, to so many people. And that's kind of getting back to that story about David Foster and starting out and then going now where I am. I think it took me to realize how much so many of my songs mean to so many people. Yeah. And once I got that in my thick skull, you know, all right, do that for those people that really care about those songs. You know, hey, look, I, you know, I went from, we went, from nothing club bands in Chicago that I was with and then went into the the group to you know later be known as a, a CTA you know and um, it's 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 amazing when you when you realize what what your songs mean mean and what it means to sing in front of people and it's yeah it got me back into it so we have some really amazing duets. We've got Cher, Shaka Khan, Amy Grant, uh, Paul Anka, you know, all these people that you've done duets with. Uh, if you could duet with anyone right now, someone right now, who would you choose? Man, I, I have no idea. There, there's, I have no idea. Yeah. Um, I haven't even thought about that and it's off the top of my head. I can't, I can't come up with one. To me, what I would love to, to have is a, is a good, rock and guy duet you know i mean there's yeah for years there was like sam and dave right yeah the righteous brothers yeah uh, well the, not so much the yeah they were they were they weren't really known for the duets i don't think right. as much as but i think that would be fabulous to have a good a good uh rocking thing with somebody i don't know that's great so i uh I'd get in trouble if I didn't ask you yeah. anything about Chicago mm -hmm. in this. And I uh, tried not to ask too much about it. Cause I, I, I mean, 
you know, I came up listening to you um, post Chicago. Right. You know, I mean, I, I mean, I did listen to Chicago, but I'm of that generation that discovered Chicago in its second wave around 16, around the David Foster, you know, jumping in era. Um, what I find interesting is when I mentioned people I'd be interviewing you, Chicago comes up. Mm -hmm. Even while we're talking, you bring up Chicago. You've now been out of Chicago longer than you were in it. And yet I find it interesting, even when I look on the message boards on your website and everything, people still asking, when are you going back to hang with Chicago? And I want to go sometimes, leave the guy alone. He's, he's done his own thing for so long now. Does that get tiresome? I, you know, do, or, or do you just go, well, yeah, I expect it at this point? Well, first of all, uh, there's only one website that I'm officially on, and that's petersatera.com. So anything other than that is not me. Yeah. So any there's and I and I stopped at, I stopped the the answering asking quite a long time ago. Um, you were giving, and you were doing uh, what I always liked about that is you did uh, autograph photos. The, you let if people sent in the uh, envelope, you sent back photos. You had to discontinue it after a while because it got to be yeah. overwhelming. You know, it's funny. Years back, I remember there was this big thing on the hubbub about Ringo. Said, hey, enough, I'm not going to sign anymore. And I thought, wow, that's weird. Never realizing that it's the Beatles, ladies and gentlemen. He's going to get a million requests a day to sign stuff, you know. Yeah. And it just got to be, for me, overwhelming because no matter what I said, people would send me Chicago albums. And, and, and could you sign these six? Uh, index card? No, I'm not. You know, and it, and it, it just, just or the photo, or they wouldn't send the return address, or they would. It just got to be. It took me longer to go through that than it did to. So yeah. I, I stopped doing it. Um, I forgot what the question was about. People asking about a Chicago reunion. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, Chicago reunion. Well, you know, and I I I, I think back about yeah in the beginning i was really bitter and uh you know it's it's kind of tough because i i spent so many years with the group and so many years right after the group trying to be uh, diplomatic you know because boy when you were when i was in the group what did you say that for i mean we got into constant arguments about and so I could never say what I really felt. Nobody really could, yeah. because you were worried about the, you know. And when I came out of the group, I, I, I really couldn't say. And then I, because I realized if I said what I really felt, <laughs> it would get some people upset, you know. Kind of like on on a much bigger scale, the Yoko Ono thing with the she's the one that broke. Like why? How could she do that? You know. And nobody really wanted to hear the negative things that Paul would want to say about about uh, John or vice versa, you know, they, yeah. they, they, they have this lovey-dovey. And the same thing in, in a smaller sense with Chicago. They don't want to hear, you know, the what really happened. They want to hear what they think. Well, you yeah, guys were such good friends and that, 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 that. And that's just not the case, you know. Will I get back to Chicago? No, I, I, I probably never should say never. But I'm about as pretty close as to saying never. It's it's not. First of all, it's not the same group. Okay. Yeah. It's a different group. Sure. <laughs> I guess they got you know the the three horn players and Bobby and that's it. You know. So a reunion wouldn't be all of us anyhow. So what's the point? I I, I don't see the point. I'm having a really good time now. Um, I like being my own boss. I don't have to answer to anybody else and. Um, the, the purpose in reunions, I, I think, for the people is so that they can relive what they had back then. And I understand that, but it's never going to be like that. A lot of groups do reunions, and to be very honest, it's only for the money. And I, I, I just can't go to that. I just can't. I mean... Uh, Maybe because nobody's offered me enough money. No, uh, <laughs> I, I just, I, I'm trying to make a modicum of truthness to myself, sure. and the truth is, that's that that doesn't ring it for me. You know, uh, I want to have fun when I'm on stage, and and I'm having fun now. 
I, I like that. I appreciate that. It's, it's just, it's such a funny thing when I would tell people I was going to be interviewing you and that would come up and I would go, he spent more time outside of this yeah. band than in the band. And I go, I, I think that that means that all parties involved like the thing they're doing, mm -hmm. but I think it must get frustrating sometimes that you go, you know, to, I, I wonder, does it, does it frustrate you to go, you know, I, I can, it's been so many years. You think you guys would know without me having to answer, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it, it, it is amazing to me, but uh, yeah, oh well. Uh, <laughs> I guess the only thing that I can come up with was, would you get back together with your ex-wife? <laughs> well, you cr Oh, yeah, I get it. And then, what about recording? Would you sleep with your ex-wife? Okay, 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 I get it, I get it, I get it, you know. Yeah. That's about the only thing that I could think what it would be like, you know. Maybe there's some sickos out there that would go, well, yeah, I would, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but... No, that's kind of what it is, you know. It's a it's a marriage that's long over with, and why I just don't, you know. Let's live in the memories, folks. Uh, just a couple more things, yeah, if you yeah. don't mind. Uh, and thanks a lot for hanging yeah, with yeah. me today. You know, um, I was talking about duets. So speaking of team ups, you've uh, in the past you've performed and, and played music with uh, your brothers. Mm -hmm. You've played with your daughters, mm -hmm. you know, you've, uh, your daughters have sung with you before. One of them has done artwork for mm -hmm. one of your albums before. Is that something that, you know, it's to keep you grounded or is it, uh, did, did they seeing you do it want to be a part of, you know, or is it a little of both? Well, I, I mean, I, first of all, it's Ken, you know, my, my, my youngest brother, Ken, mm -hmm. Kenny, who actually, I, I do have him coming out to some gigs and we hire Three Horns and he does some of the Chicago stuff that I don't do, you know, Robert Lamb stuff. Right. You know, towards the end of the set is a little special surprise. And he he does a, a Chicago experience with his seven piece group. But um, no, I think for my daughters, it was just a way of keeping them involved with what I'm doing and um, hoping that in any way it might help them what they're doing or or not you know my my oldest daughter Claire who actually I had uh, sing on a couple of things back when she was younger and then she came on the road uh, and, and sang a couple of symphony shows with me and then at a certain point when she just got older she said dad I hate to say this but it's just too weird singing love songs with your father <laughs> and I, I got that you know yeah. Uh, uh, so yeah you know you just uh, you know my youngest daughter I got her on stage, but she's not a singer. She's more of a dancer. And um, yeah, you just want to like show her what the old man does, you know? That's cool. I like that. Um, not a covers guy. You haven't really been a covers guy. So if you could do a covers album right now, uh, greatest hits of Motown or greatest hits of ACDC done by Peter Cetera? Um, that's my only choices. <laughs> <laughs> what would you choose? Well, I mean, highway to hell, come on. <laughs> no, I think, you know, there's, there's a bunch of songs that I would pick, yeah. you know, maybe not a one group, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you could, you, you, I actually did a, a Beatle cover of, a, um, of a song that John Lennon said, it's the worst piece of tripe I've ever recorded. And that's the one I did because I wanted to, uh, but, uh, no, I mean, I would do, there's, there's songs I love to sing, you know, there's, you know, off the top of my head, but, uh, um, yeah, I would do a, I would do a cover album, maybe not of one particular genre or one particular group. Uh, and, and maybe they're old, really old songs. You know, I, I, I had this com concept in my head for years about, uh, so songs my mother taught me, which is another kind of way to go of That's songs, cool. you know, yeah. so who knows? I just need to be talked into it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll make some phone calls and yeah, we'll yeah, see what I can work yeah, out. Right. Set me up. Will you? So this has really been great. I appreciate you hanging out with me today. And, uh, if there's anything you want people to know, just anything you could say right now, a message, a plea, anything you could say to North America, what would it be? Well, the, the, uh, the newest thing right now is this rock and roll hall of fame thing, which you may or may not know about. Mm -hmm. For some strange reason, through the years, there's been some kind of vendetta, and it must be with Rolling Stone because 
oh, to never be even nominated is kind of strange with me. I mean, we should have been in 30 years ago, you know? Yeah. Um, and I don't know what it is, uh, why it is or what it is, but it's just very strange to me. Yeah. Anyhow, all of a sudden now there's somebody did some voting on things and now, oh my gosh, wouldn't you know it, Chicago is now leading the votes. How about that? Well, folks, I just got to tell you, even if we win, it only counts for one singular vote out of, I don't know how many hundreds of people that are voting that have kept us out all these years. I don't know what the problem is. So it's probably not going to happen. And, um, you know, don't get your skirts all a flutter <laughs> about it. But we we appreciate the, And I'm sure, you know, the guys back there appreciate it, too. And it's, you know, it's wonderful to know that they think about you that. But it's probably not going to happen. Uh, oh, yeah. The latest is that we're the reason Chicago is ahead is because there's some kind of electronic subterfuge going on. Oh, really? Uh -huh. You caught me. Yeah. Um, it's me. I did it. I got this thing and it just keeps, I, I don't know what the deal is, but kind of a funny thing. But it's, you know, it's good to create a little excitement. And uh, there you go. We're uh, singing tonight here in, in Canada. And I, I just got to say, you know, I love Canada. I mean, I, I the Canadian people have been have been wonderful to me throughout my whole career, and uh, it's good to be back, and it's good to keep coming back. Let's say Chicago gets into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Let's say it happens, mm -hmm. and you get up on stage with all the ex-wives, and you do uh, the song, and you can only do. Let's say you do one song. What is it? Well, first of all, I don't know if I would perform. Oh, okay. that's the thing because uh, to me, not everyone does. To me, if we're gonna get if we're if we're gonna get in, it should only be the original seven. Right. It, and to be anything else to me, it would be a joke. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, since the original seven aren't here, to perform would be a joke. Yeah. So I I don't think I'd perform. Uh, uh, but I don't know what I'd do until that time comes. You know. Um, yeah, I'd probably give a, a very short-winded speech, and um, thank you very much, and how's your father, you know, and shh, gone. Thank you very much. Stay tuned. Ward and L will be right back after this.